our next evolutionary novelty is going to look at butterfly wings. Now we've done quite a bit on arthropods. As we mentioned before, arthropods and insects in particular are in some ways a perfect laboratory, a natural experiment for Evo Devo. There are many species, they're diverse, they have a really huge range of different new morphological features. So even though we've done insect body uh, and where the insects came from, we did the insect wings and now we're doing this additional feature, uh, butterfly wings, um, we're really only scratching the surface, but these are all that we're going to do for arthropods. So butterflies have these incredible structures all over their wings. They're like tiny little scales, and under the microscope they look a little bit like the dermal scales of fish, these overlapping protective scales. And this is an SEM here, you can see Then there are many different shapes. Some are quite elaborately shaped, others are just more of a, a shape like a kind of a standard scale or a spoon-like shape. shape. Um, these are distinctive for the group. Now, when I say butterflies, what I really mean is the group Lepidoptera. So it's really moths and butterflies together. And we'll look at the phylogeny in a little bit because it gives us some insight into the origin, particularly the order of these uh, unique features and how they uh, evolved, okay? So butterflies have scales over the entire surface of their wing. If you pick up a butterfly or a moth, you might have noticed this before. It looks almost like a dust or a colored powder that comes off your, your hand. These are these tiny, tiny scales. In addition, many butterflies also have these hair-like structures along the margins or the edge of their wing. Okay? Now, the first clue to this is many insects, including fruit flies, have these hair-like structures also on the edge of the wing, but they don't have any of them along the margins. Occasionally, they'll see some extras along the veins in the wings here, but there's nothing on the surface of the wings. And so ancestral insects almost certainly have these hair-like projections, but in a much more limited distribution. Today in modern butterflies, not only do we have more hair-like projections, but we also have scales covering the entire surface of the wing. Okay. So first off, let's talk about what the purpose of these scales is, particularly in butterflies, but this can be applied somewhat to moths also. So the scales are used for species recognition. This is a giant atlas moth, moth um, and their species is distinct in both um, humans looking at them, but also their own species and sometimes even other species are able to very clearly distinguish them. So aposomatic can be part of that species recognition. So for example, monarch butterflies have these bright orange and black pattern wings that allow them to communicate to their predators who and what they are. It's saying basically, I'm nasty, the birds learn to stay away from bur butterflies that are that color, and there's some really interesting evolutionary um, trends that have evolved along with that. So in addition, sometimes they have more I guess straightforward predator avoidance. So this moth, for instance, has these markings that are thought to look like a snake's head. And again, this is not really a warning saying I'm dangerous, but it's more of a disguise that makes them look like something that's dangerous, even though they're not, they're actually a really uh, good meal for, for many of these birds. And then these large eye spots also are thought to serve a similar purpose. They look like the eye of an owl or a large bird, and then smaller birds learned, or at least not maybe learn, but have an instinctual response when they see a big eye like that, have a scared, stay away. And so that's another predator avoidance. And then finally, many wings can also be used for thermal regulation. They sometimes will have different colors on the inside and the outside, or they will change the profile of their wings so they can either be out uh, gathering the warmth from the sunlight or kind of packed away, put away, um, and avoiding uh, heating up if it's too hot. So there are other smaller functions for those wings, but those are the main functions of butterfly wings that are different than most other insects. So there are three main trends that you need to know that lead to the origin of these distinctive butterfly uh, wings. And this is a tiger swallowtail up close. You can see the individual scales at this level, but you can also see some of the larger patterning and how those scales go together to make these interesting different patterns, okay? So the very first feature, the first thing that occurred along the evolution of the standard butterfly wing was a domain shift. Now we've talked about this already, right? We, we defined the very early part of class heterotopy. Hetero meaning different, 
topi meaning site. So this is a heterotopic shift where we have structures that were once only along the margins of the wings, maybe a little bit on the veins, shifting to covering the entire surface of the wing. Okay, So that is a critical and the first step towards a butterfly wing. The next thing is a brand new set of genes that modify the shape of these structures. Initially, they were hair-like in shape. Um, CD is the technical term, so they're really not hairs, they're not analogous to uh, mammalian hairs or some of the structures that we see on other extinct groups. But they, they look like hair, so sometimes people call them hairs, but CD, S-E-T-A-E, -E, that's the plural, CETA is the singular, uh, that's the more proper term. So these CD are modified into a flattened scale-like structure, but they're still very obvious and we can even track the genes that made that modification. They're still obviously just modified versions of these CD that we find all over the body and along the margins of the wings of insects. Okay, so that's step number two. First we change their domain, then we flatten them out, and then finally recruitment of new genes for pigmentation pathways. And this actually occurs in certain parts of other uh, insects. Now interestingly, in most cases, it's the wing itself that's pigmented and then it gives pigment to all the CD that are attached to that. So butterfly wings in some places do also have these colorations. And we can see these pattern, these are types of fruit fly that also have wing patterning. So that occurs not only in butterflies, but in other groups also. But in butterflies, it's most highly diverse and um, advanced, complicated, right? So some of them are of all one color or mostly one color, but many of them have these complex striping and spots and, and banding patterns. Now, how do we know the order of these three events? First, it was a domain shift. Then it was a shift towards having a, a plate-like structure, a, a scale-like structure. And then finally, the colors become um, important and become diverse. Well, the we reason that we know the order of these is by mapping them onto a phylogeny. So here is an overview of phylogeny of the Lepidoptera. Remember, that's the moths and the butterflies, and the butterflies here are highlighted, okay? So a couple of things I want to point out. First off, notice that butterflies are closely related to some moths, the Pteroforidae, more closely related to them, the Jealousy is all of these larger moths also, than they are to the other moths. So butterflies, just like birds, are just really highly adapted specialized butter, uh, dinosaurs. Butterflies are really just highly adapted specialized colorful moths, you know, adapted for life in the daytime. And moths are a paraphyletic group. So we're gonna just call this whole group Lepidoptera. When I'll say butterflies, I really mean the whole group here, butterflies and moths, unless I make that distinction. Now, the closest relative to this Lepidoptera group Right, which is here in this kind of uh, maroon color, are the Trichoptera, or the caddisflies. Now, Trichoptera, the name Trichos is Greek for hair, and Teros is wing. So these are the hairy winged uh, insects. And so this is a diagram, sorry, a photograph, of a caddisfly wing. And notice they have hairs along the veins. If we look at the margins, we'd see hairs there too, but they have hairs all over their entire wing. Most likely, this is an adaptation that increases their um, waterproof, their ability to be hydrophobic. Uh, the caddisflies are actually all aquatic and probably as a group, the caddisfly and butterfly group evolved as an aquatic group. Their larvae are aquatic, they fly around, they lay their eggs in the water, water or near the water. And so that was a key step. So I mean, kind of, uh, maybe ironically, butterflies evolved the first step in their ability to be butterflies by evolving from this aquatic group. And of course they lose that aquatic nature and then they go on and those uh, feature that, that feature hairs originally allowed them to adapt to the water now is available to do new things as they move away from the aquatic environment. So hairs come first, we can see that, or this change in domain hairs all over the wing come first. We can see that by mapping that onto the phylogeny. Now notice all of these basal groups, so the Microptoridae, Hepialidae, Adelidae, so on down the line, all of them are moths and they are not brightly colored. They do have some coloration variation, but not very much. And so we know that, but they have the flattened scales. So flattened scales evolved here in the ancestor of all of the Lepidoptera. So we know first were the hairs, next was the flattened scales, 
And then in various groups, there are different color patterns, especially in the higher moths and butterflies. So many of those genes that were being used for colors evolved here in the moths and these, or sorry, the butterflies and the higher moths, right? But um, all these have scales, flattened scales, and very little color. So by mapping them onto phy phylogeny, we know which one came first. And you should know those three and know the order in which they evolved. And this has made butterflies and moths a very hyper successful diverse group, especially the butterflies. But there are lots and lots of successful species of moths also that only have two of those three characteristics. Now, the genetic networks to these have been worked out fairly well, and you don't need to learn any, uh, any of them except for this one. But there are lots and lots of genes that are co-opted and then recruit new genes to make the different colors that we see in butterfly wings. We're going to talk about eye spots and some kind of interesting things we see. Because not only is it a familiar gene, so you don't have to learn a brand new gene, but it also reinforces a concept that we talked about pretty early in the class, that most changes that we see in organisms are due to recruitment of old genes that have another job. So we recruit a gene to do something new. And the gene here is distillus. Now, distillus, you know, also helps to grow appendages. And so distillus is actually expressed in the growing wing also. As an appendage, it expresses distillus. So all of the bright green marks are distillus. But notice there are extra strong levels of distillus that come on everywhere there's going to be an eye spot. And we can see that concentration here and here for these two eye spots in um, uh, the, the hind wing of species A. And then we have different ones that have changed the, what the species is. So these species have one of the differentiating marks are their wing spots. So just know that distillus does play a role in wing spots and butterflies. So one of the pigmentation patterns, but there are lots of other genes that play roles in those other ones. Uh, we're not going to spend time looking at all the complexity and how and where they do it. But just know that, uh, that we are, have secondary fields set up with these different genes and the same rules apply to these secondary fields. We have comp compartments with anterior to posterior uh, patterns. They really don't have much of a proximal to distal pattern because wing spots are essentially a two-dimensional thing. So we don't have proximal to distal, but we have posterior to anterior. And we have um, uh, the, the um, well, primarily just anterior to posterior is the main patterning for these. And then we have co-option of these other genes, and so we can have multiple different colors by having the same genes just then have different regulatory elements they're targeting on these downstream color things. So we could get blue spots and purple spots and green spots all from the same initial pathway. So again, reinforcing some of those same concepts. You don't need to memorize it or spend a lot of detail looking at that.